Good evening, everyone. How are you? You good? Thanks for being here. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to the Center for Brooklyn History of the Brooklyn Public Library. Can you hear me all right? No distortion? Um, you might have seen as you entered, or you'll certainly see when you leave, uh, the large sign on the wall in our welcome center. And it reads, and I quote, Brooklyn Public Library stands on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. As a sign of respect to the Lenape Delaware nation, past, present, and future, Brooklyn Public Library commits to actively addressing our past and the pervasive legacy of colonialism, exclusion, and erasure by amplifying indigenous voices, narratives, and works. And I don't think that that happens anywhere in the Brooklyn Public Library system as much as it happens right here at the Center for Brooklyn History. So my name is Marcia Eli, and on behalf of the library and the Center for Brooklyn History and all my colleagues at BPL Presents, the arts and culture arm of the library, I have the honor of welcoming you and our guests tonight. We're joined by two people who have devoted much time, energy, and talent to protecting threatened languages, and in particular, our topic tonight, indigenous languages. Ross Perlin is the author of Language City, The Fight to Preserve Endangered Mother Tongues in New York, which is a very powerful, wonderful book, which we have in our shop, and I will just insert here a, um, a strong recommendation to explore it and look through it and flip through it and Ross will be happy to sign books after the program and chat more with you. So it's, it's, a, it's a really wonderful, wonderful book. Um, Ross is also co-director of the Endangered Language Alliance, a visionary organization dedicated to preserving language diversity. Charlie Urashima co-founded and runs the media collective Kichwa Hatari, which brings the Inca-based Quechua Kichwa language to Quechua speaking communities in New York. So I can't think of two people I'd want to hear from more than, the, than these two in a conversation about indigenous languages and the critical role that they play in keeping native culture and cultural heritage alive. So Ross and Charlie, it's really an honor to host you at the Center for Brooklyn History. Will you all please help me Welcome them to the stage. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, so I'll further introduce myself and I'll pass it over to Ross. Um, so you could also further introduce myself. Uh, thank you all for being here this evening. Um, as Marsha has said, my name is Charlie, uh, co-founder of the media collective Kichwa Hatari. Uh, well, basically, it's um, it's been a journey now about ten years um, to really like organize our the Kichwa speaking community here in New York City. And when I say organize, I mean like in all senses, right? Like in terms of uh, like preserving our language, um, preserving our culture, but also ensuring that we are well, right? We, we can live, you know, we can live with dignity here, you know, in terms of work, right? That we have everything we need, that we're advocated for, um, we're represented, and also that, you know, our, um, our, our, our cosmovisions, right? Our, our understanding of this world does not get lost, right, in, 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 in this metropolis. Um, and I'm excited to be in conversation with Ross. Um, he talked a lot about that in this book. And yeah, I'm excited to delve in. So you can really introduce yourself. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And thanks so much to Marsha and the Center for Brooklyn History um, and to, to Charlie. Um, uh, who I've known for a long time and whose work I respect so much and I'm really excited to to be in conversation with and thanks to to all of you for coming. Um, I'll, I'll say a few words by way of introduction too before we kind of have a conversation and then also we'll totally be open to, to, to chatting with you guys, not just kind of after but throughout whenever there's a moment. Um, 
to say a little uh, a little bit more about Language City, the book that uh, the book that Marsha mentioned, and uh, which is 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 where I'm coming from as a linguist, and sort of um, encapsulates the work of of the Endangered Language Alliance, the organization I co-direct, which has been around since 2010 and has worked with Charlie and Kichwa Hatari and many other groups. Um, it stems from the fact that we're sitting in the most linguistically diverse city, not just in the world, but in the history of the world, as far as we can tell. Um, with over 700 languages that we have been able to, to map and to some extent document and identify as being spoken here in the metropolitan area, um, that's out of the world 7,000 plus languages. And there's a sort of paradox which the work and the book come out of, which is that more and more of those languages than ever before are endangered, as many as half, um, most linguists would say, for a variety of reasons that, that we can talk about. And, and we're talking especially about indigenous and minority or minoritized languages, which have been endangered by um, the sort of 200 odd nation states, the major empires, the major forces of colonialism and capitalism that have really elevated a small number of languages over the course of the last several centuries um, to the point where, of course, languages have always come and gone, but the situation today is is a particularly dire one. It's unprecedented in many ways, parallel to and, and, and related to the threats to biodiversity. Um, and the paradox is though that as more and more of the world's languages are endangered, more and more of them are coming to cities. Speakers are on the move. Speakers of indigenous languages are not just in far-flung territories, they're in cities. They're among us, they're our neighbors, they're ourselves. Um, they're integral to our cities. So the chance to talk today particularly about the past, present, and future of indigenous languages in New York is, uh, is a special one. The original language of this place is Lenape. Lenape forms a, a core chapter of the, of the book. Um, the book is a linguistic history of the city, a linguistic portrait of New York, I think the first linguistic biography of any city. It's also the story of the work of the Endangered Language Alliance, and then it's also a series of portraits of six speakers of different endangered and indigenous languages from around the world who've come to New York and in different ways are fighting on behalf of their mother tongues. And it begins, it has to begin in many ways with Lenape um, and the story of Karen Mosco, who, who passed away before the book came out, um, but is probably the first person to bring Lenape back to New York in, in the classroom in the form of teaching, um, which she did for several years at our center on 18th Street in Manhattan, leading Lenape classes for a really, you know, wonderful, dedicated group of, of, of students. Um, she herself came from the Lenape Reserve up in Canada. There's a far-flung Lenape diaspora today in Canada, where the last oldest native speaker in her 80s is, um, but also a courageous band of revivalists. Um, there are also uh, Lenape people in Oklahoma and in Wisconsin, and indeed in New York and New Jersey. Um, so Lenape is kind of the, uh, the base of the story. Uh, and, 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 and it's important, I think, even just to, to think of Lenape place names among us, right? Beginning with Manahata, Manahatan, there's, say again, where you were born. Are there Lenape place names that people, that people know even here in Brooklyn? Canarsie, right? Uh, and when we talk about Lenape, we're also talking not just about kind of one monolithic thing we're talking as the as as Karen explains and as the the book gets into kind of going into the languages we're talking about a whole spectrum of varieties which which differed from place to place across the whole world of Lenape Hoking um, which is not just New York City but actually the entire kind of what we call now today the Delaware River watershed so including parts of Delaware but New Jersey Pennsylvania large parts of New York and then even you know, to, 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 to kind of start with where we're sitting, uh, a few blocks from here was um, the Native American neighborhood known as Little, Little Kahnawaga, um, which was a Mohawk neighborhood. Um, and um, for 40, 50 years in the 20th century, there were speakers of Mohawk all over. Um, what's that? Kenny? Yes. Um, so we're talking about what's now people call Borum Hill, uh, a church where, where, where Mohawk was being used, kind of Kiera, um, and there were Mohawk hymns and Mohawk steel workers who built much of the skyline. 
And, um, you know, today, according to the American Indian Community House, which is uh, which, uh, uh, the oldest Native American organization in the city that we've worked with, there are members of 80 different um, enrolled in, enrolled members of something like 80 different tribes here uh, and and with various degrees of knowledge of, of, of those native North American languages and that's not even beginning to talk about native Caribbean languages and indigenous languages of the rest all of the Americas um, just according to the census there is a larger Native American population in this city than in any other city in the country which we often forget and a substantial portion of that community also identifies on the census as Hispanic Latino, which clues us into, I think, the, the major development of the last several decades as well. One of the major developments, which I, I talk about in a chapter called Indigenous Metropolis, which is that speakers of, of, of indigenous languages from across the Americas, Quechua, very prominent among them, um, have now come here to an extent where there are probably a wider range of indigenous languages um, spoken here from the Americas than in any other single place. So this is the New York that I think has been all too invisible. Uh, and I guess to kind of uh, throw it over to, to Charlie, that this question of invisibility and you know what you have known and you've substantiated, you know, among others, as as such a significant and growing community. How how does how 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 do we explain this invisibility? How do how do you navigate it? Um, you know, how, how do you think about that in terms of your work? So, yeah, I mean, I think it's tricky um, when you talk about invisibility and you talk about, um, I think, like when we, when we think of, like, indigenous languages, for example, right, um, you know, we carry that wherever we go, right? And, and before we came here, we belonged to, we have our own territories, right? For example, Quechua and Ecuador. And I think um, the, 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 stigma, the, the stigma even that we have in our own regions gets carried over when we come here. If anything, it becomes the extra baggage that we have to carry once we migrate over, right? On top of the fact that, you know, we are migrants, we like are, are different, right where where we're not even latino hispanic right although we get encapsulated in that in that category and sometimes we also have to claim or we have to claim that category ourselves be, because otherwise we wouldn't be counted at all right um and further you know as as indigenous peoples i think it becomes tricky because you know there are indigenous peoples of, of, of these lands already. And us ourselves as indigenous peoples, we are also settling into this into this land. So how do we honor, you know, the like the the living force, right, uh, of these lands, right? And also honor like where we want the language our languages, our our, our culture, our our lineage to go. Um, and I think these are these are conversations that I think, especially in New York City, has been so like I think th one of the reasons why Kichwa Hattari started in 2014 um, was because it, it, like you said in, in you say in your book, right? It's either we New York City is either like the haven of these languages, or it could become like the dead zone, right, where like it all ends, and really we can't wait on anybody right we just have to take it upon ourselves to to figure out like how are, how are we going to sustain our language how are we going to sustain uh our culture um in the midst of all the chaos that is new york city right uh in the midst of like of oh because we don't we don't we don't live in like the same neighborhoods even like we don't work in the same industries like we're kind of scattered throughout and so how do we like even begin and and it's been super important i think one, one of the, re the reason why we we get back to that point the reason why we founded Kichwa was because we needed to have these conversations and how do we have these conversations and i remember initially um we had thought, like, well, we could just gather the community in a room like this, right? Talk to everybody and kind of see what everybody wants to do, like a like a town hall. You know, we uh, we tried it and only like 
three people came, right? Because everybody's working. Um, and we we resorted to well, one of, one of the one of our, our my colleague friend, you know, uh, from the community Segundo Angamarca. He had had a radio station, and he was like, he had built this makeshift studio in his bedroom in the Bronx. Because uh, he loved radio and he built this online radio and he was like, what do we try? What if we try the radio? And that's what we did, right? We 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 we, st- we were like, let's pilot. Maybe let's do like a show for a month. Let's see if anybody listens. Like maybe that could help us do outreach and get people in the room, right? Like, like I was mentioning. Um, and then the first episode, I think you were actually there for the first episode. And then we, and then... Somehow the New York Times also <laughs> ended up being there, and uh, you know, the, the, once that article was published, it kind of blew up, and and it got covered not only by English media but also Spanish media, and it got covered by community newspapers. And people were curious, like people from our community were curious, the Ecuadorian community, the Peruvian, the Andean community was curious, like what is happening here? This Quechua being spoken on the radio. And then people started coming to us, right? It's, it's like the saying goes, right? If you build it, they will come. And we built it and they, and they started coming, right? Our community started coming to us. And for the first two years of the program, um, I would say we didn't have to invite guests. People, guests were like inviting themselves. They were like, they're like, I speak Quechua too. I also want to talk about my experience. I also want to talk about, you know, um, about my life here as a as a as a as a migrant about my art about my music about and it was i think the 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 radio became a space for i don't know just people to just come together and and really like delve delve into the language like like really acknowledge like who 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 we are who, like where we are, you know, speaking from our current experiences, because I think what happens with migration as well is that, you know, we 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 end up um, we end up associating like our, our languages with like our home territory, right? And 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 think that well, that doesn't apply here because we're in a completely other context. Um, and people started seeing that yeah, we can we can talk about local social labor issues in our own languages and i think it empowered people in that sense to to do that and i think when you talk about invisibility it's like first we need to empower our, our, our ourselves and 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 realize that and that, that and that i think i think for many people i think the radio was that right it's like giving me almost like permission to to think in my language uh, or like think out loud almost uh, here from, from where I am. Um, yeah, so I'll say that. I'll just add, I mean, I think, I mean, Kichwa Hatari has been, was so, has been so inspiring and, um, you know, major on many levels that I think, you know, sort of tie together a number of really important questions here. Um, you know, linguists talk about domains of use um, where and how a language is used, and, and and as a language becomes progressively more endangered, it, it, it's you know only being used in a more and more reduced set of domains and circumstances. And one of the most powerful things you can do is kind of extend the domains, push into other domains, uh, and show that a language can be used for anything. I mean, every language is equally capable of talking about the most modern things with the most modern technologies, talking about any kinds of issues. You might need to, you know, borrow or coin words, but languages have always done that in all circumstances. Um, and, um, you know, and radio, there is a, there is a long and, and, and proud tradition of indigenous language radio across the Americas. Uh, at the Endangered Language Alliance, we, we also for several years hosted uh, radio in indigenous languages under the name Radio Alcal with um, uh, the the head DJ Leobardo Ajtsalam, speaker of Quiche from my uh, Mayan community in Guatemala, 
and was doing he was doing radio that he was kind of hosting but there were also there was radio uh, programs this was internet radio in Garifuna which is a major um, afro-indigenous language of the Caribbean and Central America with a lot of speakers in New York um, several Mayan languages as well as Nahuatl and Mixteco two of the major indigenous languages of Mexico which are here and now have thousands of people who speak them as well um, and uh, radio is important for, I think, a number of reasons. I mean, it's, 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 it's an important domain to push into. Obviously, it's a news source. It's a way of having your own kind of, your own news, your own information. Um, and then we're also, we should remember, talking a lot about oral languages. The most of the world, I mean, primarily oral languages, most of the world's languages have traditionally been oral. There is, there is writing, of course, in, in, in Quechua, and there are, you know, it's, it's growing, in fact, fast. Um, but the vast majority of the world's languages have always been, and the vast majority of New York's languages are, are primarily oral languages. That's what's been needed for people. That's what, that's, that has served the needs. Uh, writing has really been a kind of rarefied technology often associated with kind of governments and bureaucracy and, and certain circumstances. But, uh, and so radio as a technology speaks to orality. Um, the other thing that I want to then ask you, Charlie, I mean, that, that's also part of the complexity, especially when we're thinking about indigenous languages, is that the, the, the diversity um, is, it, goes, it goes very deep because you have not had the same processes of standardization that have happened with kind of imperial and national languages. So, um, you know, when, when linguists are sometimes talking about kind of ND and linguistic diversity, uh, are talking about Quechuan as a whole kind of family of languages that stretches all the way from, you know, Colombia to Argentina, right? And, um, you know, when we're talking about Quechua, usually that's referring to the many, many people who speak it in Ecuador. But then there's, in New York as well, there are, you know, speakers who are from Peru and speakers who are from Bolivia and elsewhere. Uh, and then actually even within Ecuador, you're talking about, you know, different mountain communities, different states, different areas with different varieties of the language. Um, altogether, you're talking about, you know, some have said 10 million people or something like that, right? Um, speaking in many different ways that have not been standardized. So I'm curious to kind of ask you about that, that diversity and then also the role of Spanish and then English, you know, and how, how, how to navigate the, you know, the diversity that is within, um, you know, the Quechua world, as well as the multilingualism. Yeah, so oddly, I, I started learning um, Quechua from Peru before I learned Quechua from Ecuador. Um, Quechua being my mother tongue um, and Quechua because it was offered at NYU, New York University, uh, uh, at the Center for Latin American Caribbean Studies, and and I had, was an undergrad, and I saw that they were offering Quechua, um, and I was like, wait, is that is that the same Quechua that you know, like you know, I know my my grandparents have spoken that I hear in music sometimes. Um, that's kind of like all around. Um, uh, but never really like uh, like but never really like approached it um and uh, and i approached it and you know it, it, i i remember like even like the first class um with professor odi gonzalez um like him you know really making me at least understand um that you know learning Quechua is kind of like learning like a whole new way of thinking and a way of being existing feeling that when you try to translate it you shouldn't even bother to try to translate the feeling like you know if you need to translate it sure um if you need to borrow words in Spanish sure um but you know Quechua is if once you delve into it it's it's like many other um indigenous languages, minoritized languages, it, it, it kind of decodes like different senses um, uh, of belonging to this world. So yeah, so I, I started with Quechua and then um, when we started Quechua Hatari um, in the summer of uh, 2014, I, that's when I started learning more Quechua, approaching it. I hired uh, someone from the community um, who happened to be a bilingual education teacher in Ecuador. Um, I hired him like to give me private lessons to learn Quechua. Um, the Quechua helped 
for sure because of the the, the gr grammar, the grammatical structures and all. Um, and then with the radio, that's when I got all my practice in and 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 definitely definitely like you know was a lot of trial and error with with my kicho and in a and a radio, but. But I think what you see a lot within the language family is a lot of like, even, um, I guess like, peop there's still a lot of divisions because people will associate, be like, well, Quechua is from Peru, like that's not what I speak, right? And there's there's a lot of people who will get offended, be like, no, that's not my Quechua, that's not my Quechua, that's that's the Bolivian one, that's the Peruvian one. And, and I'm like, no, but they're all the same family, like, you know, like understand that, you know, we all come from the same root, but... I think it takes a lot more effort <laughs> to to get people to 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 do that sometimes, um, and yeah. So I think it's 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 difficult. I think like when like in your book you're talking about the, uh, the languages and dialects, right? And you know dialects. Um, and maybe you can expand on this actually, like what well, what is the difference between a language and a dialect? Um, but in our, in my my understanding, I think like Quechua is a dialect of Quechua. I don't know. You can further expand on this actually. I'll pass it you and Mike in a bit. Um, but people are like, no, like my dialect is better. My dialect is more pure. You know, my like mine is the is the closest to like what the Inca emperor spoke. Right, <laughs> um, especially the Cusqueños from Peru, they're like very like this is like we are like direct, like di di directly related to the Inca Atahualpa, right? But also without even realizing that Quechua itself was a was a language of empire, empire making as well. Like it was also imposed in the region, and there were other languages that had been spoken previously, um, but. Yeah, actually, that was, that was one of the curiosities I had. Um, the language dialect question is uh, has a sort of a linguistic answer and a political answer. And, um, you know, the political answer, if people have heard this phrase, is that a language is a dialect with an army and a navy, um, which is to say that political power uh, plays a key role. So who has an army and a navy? Usually a nation state, an empire, and they can elevate their dialect and say that, you know, this is really a language. Um, linguists try to talk about mutual intelligibility. So if two ways of speaking or varieties, to use a more neutral term that linguists like, if two varieties of speech are mutually unintelligible, we can say that they're two separate languages. If they're broadly speaking mutually intelligible with each other, we can say that they're two dialects or varieties. We kind of even avoid the word dialect because it's often used as a way of kind of um, putting down, especially oral languages. And this is this is really an issue with indigenous Latin uh, Latin American languages, especially certainly in Mexico. I'm not sure about Ecuador, but people will just say about indigenous language like it's just dialecto. It's my dialect. Um, like I, I speak a different dialect. Yeah, and, and I'm only like, Spanish wait. is like the language. Yeah. but everything else is just dialecto. Yeah. And that makes no sense linguistically speaking, right? Spanish, of course, there may be loan words that are used, but you know, indigenous languages are completely from whole other families than than Spanish, and their entire communicative systems unto themselves. Uh, so the word dialect, you know, remember we're using words that are that are used. You know, these are words in English or Spanish or a few other languages to describe varieties of speech. And I don't know what the Quechua words are actually, but there are different ways of talking about language in different languages, right? Different terms that are used that have different valences uh, and stories behind them. Um, so, you know, the, this, this gets at this question of language attitudes and language ideologies that I think Charlie was kind of gesturing towards when he said that those, you know, feelings of shame or feelings that your language is somehow inadequate, which you know, go back to colonial policy or they go back to, you know, home country situations and then are carried over here to New York uh, where people will feel like, oh, I shouldn't really speak this in public. I shouldn't let people hear. I shouldn't pass this on to the next, to, to my kids. It's not going to be useful. It's only going to get them in trouble. And that issue of intergenerational transmission, which has a lot to do with, you know, the language attitudes of the parents um, is 
fundamental when it comes to endangerment, right? Intergenerational transmission, even more than speaker numbers, is the key factor in, in language endangerment. So, you know, when you put a language on the radio or when you make official city recordings, which is something I want to ask Charlie about since, uh, you know, something he spearheaded, you know, when you, when you give a language official status in some way or other, I mean, there's still no indigenous language which has official status in New York City of any kind. There are sort of 10 official citywide languages now, which is quite something. It's a pretty recent development. Um, and it does include, you know, Haitian Creole, it includes Bengali, it includes a, a spectrum of languages from around the world, and they, they do now get some support. They all have probably at least 100,000 speakers in New York, so they're, they're big. Um, so, you know, at this point, there's no indigenous language that's, 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 that's among them, but there are ways in which, uh, through the work of the Endangered Language Alliance and the work of, of Charlie and others, indigenous languages are increasingly being recognized by by the city government are pushing into that domain, which then changes language attitudes. So one of the things, if I can, if I can put you on the spot with it, is just about <laughs> those, you know, the series of recordings that uh, that you were involved in making for the Department of Consumer and mm -hmm. Worker Protection in Indigenous languages. Um, you know that project, how you know uh, how that came about, how you the process, how you felt about that, and uh, you know, yeah, and. Yeah, I'd love to also expand a little bit more about the documentation and recognition of languages like in census, censuses and like number of speakers. Uh, but before that, yeah, I think, you know, we, I think we did this because, well, this, so we translated um, the Worker Bill of Rights in New York City uh, uh, three years, three, four years ago, I believe, um, into indigenous languages, five indigenous languages, mix, mix, Mixteco, Nahua, uh, Quechua, Garifuna, and I'm missing one. Quiche. Quiche, yes. Quiche, correct. Um, and, you know, that took a lot of, a lot of pressure. I, I you know, I, I work in, in, in labor, um, and I, I've, I interact with, immigrant workers every day um and you know i, I used to work in, in queens right on roosevelt avenue and like where a lot of day laborers would come in um every morning we would open at 7 a.m people would come needing help because they have a issue with wage theft an issue uh yeah an employer they're looking for work an employer hasn't paid them any number of services and a lot of people, you know, would there are some there are people who can kind of who you know, like you know, they know what they know, like the services they're coming for. There's some people who don't know that there's recourse um, for them, and oftentimes the people who don't know that there's recourse are often new migrants. And and I was seeing a lot of for a period of time, like a lot of new migrants. Um, from that are speaking indigenous languages, right? They would come with like one person. One person would come speaking on behalf of like six workers that were behind him. And he would turn around and speak to them in, in Kakshikel or Kiche. He'd be like, he'd be tell, telling them what I'm saying. And I'd be like, well, there should be a way to like also reach, you know, uh, workers who are coming in, in masses right now from, from indigenous communities. and. And so I started pushing the the, the Department of Consumer Worker Protection. It took about three years um, for for them to like finally find funding and like support this project. Uh, and we did it in uh, we did it orally as well. We I, I I I tried to make the point of telling them like you know if we just translate you know the Worker Bill of Rights through text in Indigenous languages, it'd be more of a symbolic move. Um, but if you really wanted to have use, um, some usefulness, we would do it in, in oral, we would do it orally, right? Because a lot of these languages, as you had mentioned, are, are oral. Um, and it took a lot of guidance because, you know, a lot of people in city agencies don't, aren't familiar with this, right? They don't know where to start, where to, where to, where to look, where's, where do I find an interpreter? And like, I remember when I got, first got the files, the audio files, they had even like mixed up the name, like Kiche from Ecuador and like um, 
a quichua from Guatemala, like something like that. And I was like, y- y- y'all are labeling things wrong already, you know. Um, but anyway, it took a lot of like hand holding, um, precisely because it, there there is no there there's there's hardly any recognition. I think that and that goes to, back to my point about how what does what does it take for an indigenous language or, an, or a minoritized language to um, become recognized in, 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 a, in, a, in a city or even towns because it, and you, you also talk about like there's like there there's like communities and towns and I remember Spring Valley Spring Valley up in New York or, or York Pennsylvania um, Purépecha Purépecha right um, our buddy Al- of Mexico Alexis yeah so how, what how did, what does it take for indigenous languages endangered languages to get recognized by by uh, the municipalities and to like receive services in, in those languages um, and now and thinking also about the census because I remember the census being a big deal um, the last census and you know there were campaigns like you know write down your language like m- make sure you say that you speak Quechua, you speak Nawa, you speak Kakshikel. Um, and yeah, like curious also about like how, how that. Yeah, I think this ties into a number of the things that we're talking about because, uh, and, and the question of visibility. I mentioned that um, officially the number of Native American New Yorkers in the last census, 180,000 plus, substantial, and we know that dozens of languages are spoken. But the language question, there's just one question on the census about language. And uh, it's actually not on the decennial census that's given every 10 years. It's on the American Community Survey. And the way that it's asked, as well as who fills it out, what languages it's offered in, people's trust in the census, means that actually indigenous languages are really not represented in the census data, uh, almost at all. Languages that we know are spoken by thousands of New Yorkers are basically not are not there in the data. Uh, and so, you know, you have to make the case that they're there when it comes to these to city agencies. I think increasingly people are are becoming aware, uh, and that that has been some of our our work at the Endangered Language Alliance. This is was maybe the biggest impetus behind the creation of our language map, which there's a print version of, and then you can also go to languagemap.nyc, and like I said, has you know over 700 languages there with recordings of many of them that that we've done as part of our work, also as well as kind of stories and and and, and descriptions. Um, and um, that led to various city departments, Department of Health, Department of Education, kind of contacting us and, and realizing that many of the most vulnerable New Yorkers in particular, and I think it's true in the world of labor, it's true when it comes to education and health, um, are, are, are indigenous, indigenous Latin American New Yorkers who, you know, even within the broader migrations from Latin America have often been kind of, for all these historical reasons, at the bottom of the social hierarchies, working the toughest jobs in the toughest situations. Um, and that has, you know, and, and, and often very ironically, you know, not, not with, without papers, not so not documented, and so vulnerable on all these fronts, which have only increased since 2016 and COVID. Um, and so our work increasingly came about, you know, substantiating the presence of these large and fast growing communities. Um, and then, you know, doing the kind of work that, that Charlie did with the, the Department of, uh, of Consumer and Worker Protection, but on different fronts, audio and video recordings in the languages which involved a whole kind of host of, mm-hmm. of, of challenges. And we've increasingly been contacted by you know, the courts, by hospitals with requests for interpretation as, as people realize that actually you know, not, all, not all people from Latin America speak Spanish. Mm-hmm. And there actually are indigenous language speakers from Mexico, Ecuador, and elsewhere who, you know, they may speak Spanish now to some degree because the pressure around Spanish is immense, but actually you know, the mother tongue and the, and the language that you know, when it's a life or death situation, court, hospital, immigration, I mean, at the border, many of the most uh, so-called commonly encountered languages are actually indigenous languages now, especially in recent years, indigenous uh, Mayan languages of Guatemala. Uh, so, you know, there's a need, and now there's there's been a, a, a lot of activity now around kind of creating an indigenous interpreters co-op as well, which is a very important step, uh, because there's all kinds of issues in how interpretation is done, and, and, and kind of who provides that, who the city contracts with, even when it does 
kind of uh, recognize the need for that. So there's a tremendous need. And, uh, and I guess, you know, another thing to kind of just add to this and to ask you about is, you know, just in the last couple of years, right, there's this, you know, over 200,000 people uh, have come as asylum seekers largely to New York in the last couple of years. Um, it's, you know, uh, a, 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 a even more kind of unprecedented and challenged than, than I think the, the migration that has started over the, you know, the, over the last several decades. Uh, and many, many are Quechua speakers or speakers of other indigenous languages. Um, so I'm curious what you're seeing in kind of the last couple of years uh, with new speakers arriving and also even within the vast world of Ecuadorian New York, right? There are, there are non-indigenous Ecuadorians and, and how all of that is playing out now with sort of changes in, in Ecuadorian New York. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think like I had mentioned before, kind of like these roles that, that you know, that um, in society, these like social norms that, you know, that, that, the social dynamics that get played out in Ecuador, like they also come come here, you know, and I think it's been tricky um, navigating that, especially now given I think the visibility. I feel like there's more visibility now because there's so many, there there's so much migration of indigenous language speakers of Quechua speakers, primarily. Um, it's how how do we support? It's always it's always been like that like that balance it's like how do we how do we support the survival how do we ensure the survival the sustainability of a language that someone is coming with but at the same time understanding that there are real needs real there's like real is a real situation there's there are real dangers there are real um um there's just there's just there's just real situations that people come with right you know and people are looking for work right and like you can't approach someone you know um a street vendor and be like hey like you know i want to invite you to uh a quichua conversation circle right or um even like documentation of your own language when they're like well i have you know i'm here vending like 12 hours a day i have to go home see my kids my three kids and like people are surviving here are, are like are, are barely surviving especially today right um at the same time you have and like and like this was happened recently like in in bushwick you know like police harassing street vendors right um it was only a couple months ago where um a, a quichua vendor he he was harassed by the by the police you know, given a fine and, you know, he, he, they tried to take his car. He was like, no, like, I'll just go home. Like, let me just go. And, and eventually it got physically violent in a way. And like, he ended up having to go to the hospital. Um, he had a concussion and, it, and, you know, he woke up in a hospital. His first language is Quechua, not knowing how to navigate these, the resources in the city, you know, and it's, it, and then, you know, and then they call us and we're like, okay, like we're like, let's, let's send somebody to help. And then even being an interpreter and like, I, I haven't done interpretation. Um, I haven't done interpretation really. Um, but we have, I have a colleague who does interpretation and like, he comes to these cases in the courts, in the schools and the hospitals. And, he, you know, he's like, I want to help advocate for my community, but I can't because they're telling me I just have to translate. You're right. I have to like separate myself from the situation, even though I want to like help advocate. I want to help, you know, um, this person get uh, get the resources to communicate effectively, you know, um, to the people who who can get their, them the the resources that they need, um, but they're not allowed to, right? And there, so there's that other layer, um, and yeah, so. I think it, it, the situation now it's 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 it it's tricky. I think it, it requires. I mean, we we've we haven't done the radio in about like a year and a half. We had to take a break. So if, you know, COVID was very. It was we kind of got burnt out from COVID. Um, it was week after week providing information, resources to our community, and we all went virtual. We lost our radio studio. Uh, in the Bronx, and so we're just we're trying to figure out how to come back um, 
but that's like a logistical um, question. But COVID was, I think our community was like, we had to do rapid response, right? And I, I actually want to ask you like, what's been the role of Endangered Language Alliance? And I think I like how in the book, you talk about Endangered Language Alliance as kind of like, it's not, and you say, what is it exactly that you say, right? Like, like these languages, there's a lot to study, but nothing to romanticize, right? And you talk about Endangered Language Alliance's role in not doing, not replicating what gets done in academia or in like in research spaces, right? And you're just documenting the language. I think it showed a lot during COVID. And I don't know if you can speak a little bit about that and what, that's, what that says about the approach of Endangered Language Alliance and the work that you all have been doing with languages. When the Endangered Language Alliance was, was founded in 2010, it was kind of, at least initially, partly out of that recognition of that opportunity that more and more languages were endangered and yet more and more speakers were coming to cities and that cities... Um, you know, were places where linguists and language activists and speakers and artists and ordinary people could all kind of get together to work on language projects. But a good amount of that initially was the work of documentation because um, the majority of endangered languages are also not well documented, um, not just in the sense of, you know, the presence on the census or maps or official data, that's also true. But even, you know, again, going back to this question of orality, in terms of, uh, you know, dictionaries and grammars and all the kinds of things that are taken for granted by speakers of larger languages, um, you know, records of a language that then enable speakers who want to teach it or who want to uh, pass it on or create textbooks or children's books, you know, in many cases that, that doesn't exist because traditional oral transmission, you know, didn't, didn't require that stuff. But many language movements today, you know, they, they, they want those materials, certainly from a kind of linguistic point of view, the point of view of, of linguistic diversity more generally, it's, 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 it's vital to have, you know, archives, recordings, records, even if it's for the next generation. So there's this whole world of language documentation and, and, and you know, we're talking not just about words, but we're talking about the, the poetry and wisdom and, you know, knowledge um, of, of speakers and, and their histories. And this has been, you know, a lot of our work um, for, for, for a long time. And it certainly was my, you know, point of entry as a linguist. Um, but as, as the book describes, and as Charlie says, I mean, there, there has been a change as well in, in, in our, our approach over time and a recognition uh, that 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 it's you know that a language and its speakers are are inseparable. You can't or signers if we're talking about sign languages and and there are something like two hundred sign languages in the world, many of them endangered. Um, we're really talking about um, something that is lived and felt and inhabited, and it's not um, you know it's not just about a sort of a dictionary or an archive. It's uh, it's part of life. Obviously, you know the question of whether to maintain or pass on a language. This is in the hands of its of its speakers or signers, its community, um, and you know these issues of livelihood and health and just housing and work. These are, are fundamental and, and you can't, you know, you, you, you can't sort of go around them. Um, and uh, I think also in terms of writing Language City, I think, you know, initially I, I thought when I started to become involved in this work that the city would just get more and more diverse people from all over the world. This would just become a microcosm of the world. Of course, it's not, you know, uh, perfect and, you know, it's not all peaceful. There's all kinds of tensions. There's all kinds of, you know, but at the same time, it's this maybe the greatest social experiment ever, you know, contemporary New York and especially places like parts of Queens and Brooklyn. Um, but I think, you know, what we felt in the last, you know, five to 10 years is that actually there, there are mounting threats. There are many and mounting threats. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're living in an anti-immigration, anti-immigrant backlash that is really unprecedented for the last century. Uh, but very much mirrors the, the 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 movement that led to America closing its doors to immigrants substantially in 1924. We could see that repeated now on the hundredth anniversary of that. Um, you know, so there there's all the threats to immigrants and immigration. There are a series of crises. Um, you know, COVID at the top, which disproportionately for a variety of reasons affected multilingual immigrant communities. There's a reason why the epicenter of the epicenter was. Jackson Heights Corona, 
um, those areas of Queens, but also parts of, of Brooklyn and the Bronx, because it was also a language crisis, an interpretation crisis, an information crisis. Who were the essential workers? They, 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 were, they were the deliveristas, heavily indigenous, um, you know, from, from, from all over, but especially many from Mexico and Guatemala, uh, who kept the city's food system going, but also then exposed themselves more to, to the virus and had no, no choice but to continue working. So in the face of all that, um, you know, at the Endangered Language Alliance, a lot of our work became about messages and information, you know, working with speakers to put that information out there in a timely way to assist in the various forms of mutual aid that were happening where, you know, government response was was not there, the government be barely realizing that the communities are even are even here. Um, and, you know, trying to 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 through through language to uh um, you know, to, 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 to help people with the basic challenges of, of life. Um, so I don't know, I have a lot more questions for you, but maybe should we see what, yeah, see what's out, you know, see what you guys have yeah. to have to ask and then we'll, yeah. we'll just go yeah. from there. Yeah, we can open it up. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I have a question uh, for you. Uh, you said you have uh, a radio show in Quechua. Yes. Uh, is it available in podcast form? It's not. I mean, that's one of the conversations we've been having because when we started, it was it was a community radio, mostly online based. Um, our reach was primarily here. Well, our our target audience was New York migrant Quechua communities and we also happen to have a, a, a like a large audience outside like in Europe and different places where our people are so um yeah we've been trying to like cater cater a little bit more of the messaging and like the, the programming towards like a larger audience a diasporic audience um and I think one of the things that we're considering now is yeah podcasts mm-hmm Um, over on your left, I was wondering what your thoughts are on when large companies or corporations make efforts to reach out to indigenous language communities. I'm thinking specifically of like Disney movies that have that like Moana, they wrote a, there's a song in there that's in an indigenous language. Does that feel like pandering to you? Does that feel like representation just those are just tell me what you think um i have many opinions about that um <laughs> but i mean i will say like i think for a while i think what early on when we were starting to organize with the kicho community with the community radio you know it, it the, the purpose was yeah we don't have a space for us to like just talk and just like uh, where you feel represented right because these media channels media networks don't don't reflect our realities right like in in spanish even you only have two or three major networks telemundo univision and i don't know i don't know i forget the other one <laughs> but so yeah like you know part of the fight has been representation but when the corporate america you know sees you know when they when they see like when they see that one is fighting for representation they, they're easy to like co-opt right co-opt our languages co-opt our our you know same disney that tried to trademark uh was it dia de los muertos huh dia de los muertos right it's like you go to that extent where like yeah like you know we fight for representation but no 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 this is actually like we still want this like this is still ours like we just want you to like acknowledge us and respect us and and hear us out like we still want our autonomy we still want like to come up you know we talk about sustainability we talk about the future of our languages we want to determine what that looks like right um the other thing about um last thing i'll say about our language is is that you know uh, oftentimes people say like well since you know, you're doing work with the Quechua community. Are more people speaking the language? Are people, um, do you see the, like, like, younger people learning it more? Um, 
And, uh, you know, I don't have an answer for that because, again, it's not documented. Um, but what I always tell people is, like, I feel like at least people know that there's an option, right? Because I think, like, like, my parents, my grandparents, growing up, they felt like that wasn't an option at all to 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 learn your indigenous language. If anything, it was a burden that you needed to, like, you know, to, to, to take off. Um, and I think coming here, I think like as a, seeing also the diaspora, the diaspora growing and seeing like how people are approaching the language or the culture in their own ways. And, and it doesn't have to only be in speaking the language, but it could also be through art, through music, through, uh, filmmaking through even photography like there's there's so many ways one can approach um their their identity that i think like i said i think at least we have the option to, today to do it oh. <laughs> um okay next question Hi, I just wanted to say thank you for coming. It's been a very like amazing presentation. Um, I'm actually Kichwa myself. My parents dropped the dropped the ball with me though, so I don't really speak it. Um, but oh, I was wondering, especially with endangered languages, one of the main like factors for um, it's like endangered status it's is transmissibility between generations, especially between like the older generations and the younger generations. So as that I was wondering. Um, what can schools do both at either the um, the curriculum level or even at the pub like the policy level do to support students who are at the crossroads of like these different identities and communities, especially in New York, where we where for example, my family is they spoke, they spoke like English, Spanish, Quechua, but it's all really hard to balance, especially for younger children. No, well, I'll say a few words, but then I want I want to hear you. Um, so, in in the last words you just said, I mean, pointing to the multilingualism of of the community and and many indigenous communities here, it's actually we need to remember that it's not it's it's not a deficit. It's actually a multilingualism that people have, you know, degrees of of an indigenous language, and there's all kinds of levels of speakerhood as linguists talk about it. So it's you know. Um, and again, we should remember that everything we're seeing through the prism of our of, of the language that we're using. So when we talk about fluency, for instance, we're actually using an English kind of metaphor or a metaphor that's really from a few languages about, you know, in this case, flowing like water. Um, but there, there are different conceptions of what it means to be a speaker in different situations. And, you know, a, a lot of kind of interest and discussion now in different types of heritage speaker and ways that that can be, you know, and then there are different relationships to the language that one can have. For some people, it's about ceremony or connections with art or film or other, other music or other things. Um, so, you know, it need not always be thinking about, you know, fluency, vernacular, exactly that. But certainly, you know, intergenerational transmission is central. Education systems, you know, I think can play a role. Uh, and I guess speaking broadly about language revitalization movements, we're in a kind of golden age of language revitalization in some ways. And there's all kinds of interesting experiments happening from, you know, uh, the Hawaiian language to Wampanoag in a native language of Massachusetts. Um, and, you know, all kinds of things going on in the Andes as well. Uh, ways that languages are being revitalized. I think education, formal education, as in school systems, is one avenue. And and for some, you know, it's 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 an important one and can have some important symbolic value, especially now that you know formal education again is a pretty novel new thing for in most of the world, most communities, as opposed to you know sort of traditional forms of education, master apprentice relationships, other forms of transmission. Um, but, you know, here in New York, we are seeing now dual language programs in 13 different languages that are happening. Spanish, of course, the most, but, uh, you know, it's a series of experiments. We don't know where they will go. It'd be really exciting to see, you know, one day, for instance, a Quechua uh, dual language program in New York. It's not impossible. There are ways that these things can be started. There are, there are 
um, things that are happening. Um, but I think it's important to, to, to see the formal education system as just one sort of avenue. Um, but I'm curious also now in Ecuador what's happening and whether there are you know, there is use in the schools at all, what that means, or maybe in Peru or elsewhere. Um, and, you know, yeah, how you see the role of, of education as opposed to other strategies. Yeah, I think, you know, as, as one of the difficult things in, in Ecuador, for example, has been um, because of the, the variations of languages, like, like Quechua, we say Quechua, but, you know, there are variations within Quechua in the Andes from the north, of Ecuador to the south of Ecuador to the Amazon and, you know, uh, coming up with like a, a standardized, and I think I'm mostly curious to hear what, <laughs> what your opinion is about this because there's been like efforts for gener for decades, right, to like standardize a, a written Quechua form. Then there's been efforts to standardize a Quechua uh, 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 lexicon and there's been a lot of resistance to it too, though, right? Because it's like you're not going to tell me how to I can how to write my language, right? That I've been speaking, my family has been speaking for generations, right? And this is how we speak, it and we're not going to adapt. Um, so yeah, I think like when you come into this formal, in, formal uh, settings, formal institutions, educational institutions, it like like Ross was saying, I think it's one way. Um, it, it definitely isn't the only way, right? Um, I think even like hearing like people I meet, um, um, heritage speakers like like myself, or or people who are coming into the language, like reconnecting to 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 their roots. You know, it's it's like you kind of you kind of have to take it upon yourself sometimes. You know, I've heard people say like, you know, I. I practice my language by like speaking at home to myself, you know, like I, I just have to speak to myself in that language um, or, you know, watch YouTube videos all day uh, in that language if there are videos. So, or like having like, you know, names of things in, in around the house, like labeling things in, in your language so that you can have some, um, like some exposure to it. So. There's definitely different ways. I don't think there's like one way necessarily at the educational institutions. I think it's it, it's definitely a major place that where I think we should um, have more influence in, but I think we, we, we don't. I'll just add that at the Endangered Language Alliance, we've also been a space for community language classes. Um, and there are community language classes happening kind of all over all over the city in different communities. So. Uh, Atik Pawai was teaching uh, Kichwa with us for, for a little while, uh, as well as uh, uh, Elva, who from the uh, Peruvian Quechua speaker, uh, from what was called the New York Quechua Initiative. And there, there still are uh, classes in um, at least Quechua, I know, you know, that are happening virtually and in the city. Uh, and then there's also the work at some academic institutions. So Odi Gonzalez at NYU, and there's now a kind of Quechua uh, library or Quechua library that's being built out there, I, I understand. Uh, and then it's being taught at other universities. So it's kind of the formal instruction piece is growing, and then there are conferences and gatherings. So that's also, that's, that's also really cool to see. Um, but yeah, it does raise challenges of like, okay, well, the, you're going to have textbooks, you're going to have a, videos, who's going to, what stand, what, what language is going to be spoken there? How do you allow for, you know, all the variation that's there? And, and a question that many language movements confront is this question of standardization or unification. How much do you sort of give up, uh, of the individual variation in order to, kind of unite or, or, or have more sort of speakers or, or build convenience that way. And each kind of community and activist kind of finds a different set of answers, I think. It is on. Um, uh, given the challenges of education that you've just described, what's the appetite um, around uh, teaching more Indigenous languages to people for use in sort of like civil services or border services? Because I can imagine there's like, perhaps sometimes there's an unwillingness to engage with like the government because of various reasons, right? But 
like I could see a world where like having more people who work for the government, who work in civil services for people who speak these languages, that could have a, like a huge benefit. But like, what's the overall appetite for that across like uh, the activist community? Well, I'll, 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 I'll just say that, I mean, we have to, I mean, every, every language from a linguistic point of view is, is essentially just as easy for a child to learn, you know, in that sort of growing phrase as a first language, um, you know, before the sort of critical period, which, you know, linguists debate exactly what the critical age is, but unfortunately for all of us, I don't see anybody sort of under seven, we're all a little bit past our prime as language learners, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, when it comes to learning a second language, especially as an adult, um, then the difficulty is based on your first language and where you're coming from. And for a speaker of English and Spanish, for instance, um, to learn a language like, like Quechua or, to, or Mixteco or, or many indigenous languages is a very hard thing to do. Very hard thing to do. Uh, and you know, it's, it's made all the harder by the fact that there aren't that many spaces and domains to do it in, that even speakers might, you know, might be cautious about engaging. Um, you know, I'm curious what you think in terms of what the, you know, how it feels or does one encounter outsiders who actually have learned uh, the language well. I, in my experience, they're very rare. You know, it's very rare that you'll find anybody from outside, outside the community who um, you know, can, has, has, is dedicated enough to really, to, to learn. Um, and perhaps they might be welcome to some extent, uh, you know, if, if they are, but it's, it's, it's rare that you would find that person who is such a dedicated civil servant or, um, you know, and the, what it really requires is living with people, being with people. Um, language, as I say in the book, is an index of time spent with people. And in most cases, it's really about being part of a community, being in it, um, and as, as Charlie was saying, it's, it's tricky in, even in, in New York or in most cities, um, you know, where even if there are a lot of speakers, if there aren't really sort of neighborhoods or if there aren't that many spaces, um, you know, even those who want to be sort of with people don't have as many opportunities to, to do that. So uh, I think there's interest. We certainly hear from a lot of people who are interested and want to do it, um, but the, the challenge is, is serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, it's even hard, like I mentioned before, for folks from the community to even engage with, like, interpretation, right? Because, you know, they're, it becomes almost, like, transactional. It's like you're only here to translate, and you, that's it, you know? And it, it, oftentimes it's, like, in these, in these organizing advocacy spaces where we're able to, like, yeah, we were able to like to bring bring the language to life because when we're doing court interpretation, for example, it's like it it becomes it becomes really sad, right? That you're 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 relegated to just like um, your your language is relegated to like maybe prosecute or like in, in incriminate somebody from your own community, right? Um, but beyond that, also what the interpretation I also wanted to mention was there's a lot, there's appetite for people to help their, help their community as well. Well, we've run into a lot. And I think that's why when you were mentioning the, uh, the co-ops, right. The reason why there's, there's appetite to, to start, um, uh, cooperatives for indigenous language interpreters is because a lot of people who are doing the interpretations in, in these court schools and hospital settings, sometimes they legally can't work here, right? Because um, they are also like a migrant themselves. They also, they probably, you know, are undocumented. They probably are, are like don't have the, the appropriate, appropriate credentials, right? And how do you even get credentials, right? To become an indigenous language interpreter in the courts, right? To become a Spanish interpreter, there's a series of like tests, you know, you, you have to go through like, you know, many hurdles and, but they're, tangible right to become an indigenous language interpreter there aren't right and you i'll get emails from courts being like do you speak like quichua from like bolivia in or or aymara quichua i'm like what like they, they don't even understand what they're looking for um so 
I think it, it becomes it, it also becomes a question for like the like government systems to also uh, become more educated on, on this as well, like uh, like be more culturally aware of the communities that that are that that they're surrounded surrounded with, um, and how to like appropriately respond to it. Hi. Um, so something that I've been thinking about in this conversation is um, the concept of assimilation and just how much that plays into, I think, this concept of endangered language. And so, um, you know, and even thinking about like what it is to learn an indigenous thing an indigenous language, right? And how part of that is also intertwined with like decolonization and kind of unlearning um, your own perception that is just drawn by cap living in a capitalist society, living in America, right? And so, and even just the concept of um, so much um, diversity in indigenous languages being here in New York, I think also, um, you know, acknowledging or being um, kind of a symptom of even like U.S. involvement in other countries that then leads people to like um, need to find some a new way of life here. And so I guess in thinking about how a dying of a language or a culture sometimes isn't always by choice, sometimes it's survival assimilation. And so I'm wondering like, and I love the conversation about all these forms of like uh, reclaiming and recovery, but I'm also wondering like, um, is part of the fight too, like, um, you know, thinking of ways to even like prevent it from like getting there in the first place. And like, I don't know if that's part of conversation or if that's something that feels like far away or if it's something that either of you um, reflect on, because I imagine this is... Um, heavy work and heavy stuff to think about all the time. So um, I was just curious if you had thoughts around that. Sure, I can, <laughs> I can start. And then I, that's also um, something I found really interesting in your book. You talked about, you know, because oftentimes we look at endangered languages and we kind of just like look at the word endangered where like, oh, wow, like, like these species, like bird species, like nature, like almost like there's like there's a natural death of things, right? And we think of endangered languages, we think of like like things just naturally dying off, right? Kind of like this, that's just how things progress, right? Things just happen, right? Um, but we don't see it as we don't see it as an extension of the colonial project, right? Uh, an extension of, of empire making has been to like has to intentionally wipe out these languages right if like the more different you are the more the more different you are the more you don't subscribe to like western standard what western like ideals of this of this of this world like the, the more outcasted you will become the more um the more you'll be targeted, you know, in, in, in many cases. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it definitely warrants like a hours long conversation around like, you know, um, you know, empire making and, and like, and like, and like language. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's very present, right? I think, I mean, for, I'll, I'll just speak for like, like Kichwa Hattari in the, on the community radio. Some of you know we some of the things that we try to do um, as is some of the some of the things that we try to do is like really talk about language not not only or language or culture everything and like the loss of it and and it's not something that that just happens right because a lot of times people will come or people will call in or people will be guessing they'll be like well it's you know like that's i'm just the last generation and like my kids don't speak it anymore and you know well what can be done right and it's like a lot can be done right there's a lot that can be done we still like we have it in our hands but we also can't just let the it's like the system the system like consume us right we also have to create our own like utopias of sake, right? We also have to create our own systems and we come with knowledge, right? Like we we have our knowledge, we have our way of doing things, of doing things in community, right? Um, 
you know, like uh, in, in Quechua, there's a word for uh, uh, minga, right? For example, is the word for like doing things like almost like reciprocity, right? Like you help me, like when neighbors, co when community comes and helps one person so that in the future, that person, another person needs help, community will also go and, and help. And we can still do that here. We can apply those ways of, 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 of living and, and, and existing in, in community like here, right? There's, there's no, like, we shouldn't just see it as like, well, we're here, you know, in, in the belly of the beast, right? So we might as well just subscribe to everything that it has to offer and um, kind of let things go. And it takes a lot because I think a lot of, it takes a lot of work because a lot of, there's this like sense of like, well, of like, I don't want to be this ungrateful migrant right like i don't want to come i don't want to be like we're we're guests here right we're guests on this land not even guests of not even like guests uh when we're talking about the lands the original inhabitants of this land but guests to that it's a u.s government right we have to be behave well we have to just work you know um keep our heads low you know the more invisible we are, the better, right? But that's not the case, right? And I think part of the work is that it's like uh, empower yourself in, in in who you are, your language, and your culture, and also like like be who who I don't know I don't know how how to say this, but like um like create our own ecosystems right like we can we can create our own ecosystems where we are from where we are um and it doesn't need to align always with with like with whatever's around us um and i think that's the beautiful thing about like languages in general and I, you were talking in, uh, in your book about uh, speakers of a language that live in in an apartment building or something and I was like, wow, that sounds amazing. Like that's your own, you're creating your own like little utopia. Um, and I mean, that an ideal world, that's what it would be like. But um, but no, I think like it, it takes a lot to, 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 to both challenge the system at the same time as like you're also trying to like um, sustain like your, your own way of like existing or the, the way that you know how to exist yeah i love that answer and, and don't have much to add except to say that the pressures of assimilation are are massive and constant and deep and multiple it's assimilation not just to to english but to spanish to particular varieties of english particular varieties of spanish um, and, and communities all over the city and all over the world are going through these sort of multiple multiple assimilations under immense pressures that are both centuries deep in their, you know, uh, and totally fractal in, in the, the way they affect people and, and, and down to the details of daily life. Um, and, and yet, you know, hundreds of years after um, the arrival of, of settlers from, from Europe in the Americas, hundreds of indigenous languages of the Americas are still spoken, um, and some by large numbers, and, and some, you know, many all around us um, here in the city. So I, in, in some ways that also needs to be just celebrated, recognized, and is an enormous testament to, um, to, to a history of the will to, to keep speaking. Yeah. Charlie. Um, I'm Quechua Chanka, but I speak far more Quechua Tabaleño, um, similar to you, learned it at UCLA. Um, my question is actually really related to that intersection, and you both touched on it very briefly, but at the moment there's a lot of kind of intra-community tension in the Andean community because of these different Andean languages, dialects, whatever you want to call it. And I think that there's compelling arguments on both ends, on one of language preservation via standardization and on the other of standardization as a colonial practice in and of itself. And so I'm really curious what 
both of your thoughts are on this kind of question of Quechua, Quechua standardization, considering just how many different Quechua or how many languages exist under the Quechua umbrella and also what, you know, what standardization could mean for preservation, what preservation could look like without standardization. Um, yeah. I'd like to hear from you first about the question of standardization. Like, what are what are some pros and cons? Because I I always I also go like back and forth between like, I think when I started I was like learning I was like, you know, like standardization shouldn't exist. Like, you know, we need to like keep the wealth of like our, you know, our our, our languages and the plurality of them, and and then uh, through, through Kichwa Hatari, you know, seeing like, yeah, just go ahead. <laughs> I think standardization is, is a complex concept that actually covers a number of things. And so it's maybe worth kind of peeling back some of the layers and thinking about ways that, it, that, 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 that there could be strategies of unification and unity um, and, and that, 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 that help a language movement. Um, so one thing that linguists are increasingly studying is called implicit standardization, which is basically where people sort of move towards a standard through more interaction. It's not a top-down process, and it even can be a somewhat unconscious process. Um, and it can come actually in a sort of diaspora capital like New York, where if people of different varieties are encountering each other and spending time with each other, they just start kind of adjusting towards each other in ways that are not you know, felt as top down um, and that, that start to promote more um, getting that critical mass of speakers kind of behind a, a language um, and, you know, creative adjustment. I remember, you know, I, I don't really know how it works, but I think it was Fabian uh, maybe telling me, maybe it was Segundo when we were recording some messages maybe in, in City Hall about uh, the NYC ID. You know, I was talking to, I think it was maybe Fabian, like, oh, so how are you, you know, what variety are you think you're going to use? How are you going to do this? And he's like, you know, I, I'm going to find a way to kind of bring in different words and different bits that will make everybody kind of feel like, you know, at least everybody from a, a, a section of Ecuador feel like they're being kind of heard. And so that there, there, there are ways to do it that are not kind of top down, but that are sort of, you know, people being sort of multi-dialectal, trying to sort of reach out to, to, to different varieties. And, you know, in some cases, there, there is a sort of prestige variety. And I'm sure, you know, some Cusqueños would feel that that is because there's a historical role and, and there's, a, there's a sort of a logic to it. But there can be sort of, um, a language can be pluricentric. There can be multiple centers of prestige varieties. Um, so, you know, and we could talk about different forms of standardization that are, that are more sort of oral versus written. So people could continue to, you know, orally use, uh, all the different, you know, ways that they know, but then in the written, the written form could try to converge more. And then the written form could be, um, you know, certain writing systems that you know, Chinese characters or the Arabic writing system actually are, are sort of unifying in and of themselves and actually sort of mask uh, difference more than the Latin-based writing system. So the fact that Quechuan languages are using a Latin-based writing system actually maybe sort of exposes the differences more or brings them to the fore. But still, you can, there are ways that writing, you know, can, can, uh, can unite while speaking. So I would say, you know, the thing to avoid is, you know, classes where somebody is told you're speaking wrong, right? Uh, or any time like that. <laughs> in many classes. You've heard like that. that. <laughs> and th there's also generational issues too that are also kind of at perpendicular to this issue where often, you know, the older generation, because you're talking about language change over time too, that's natural. The older generation will say, you're speaking wrong and that will discourage people in many cases. So that kind of, you know, language purism um, really I think is, is important to avoid. That, that should be a core principle, I, I would say, of most language movements. Unfortunately, language purism which I think has many sources. I mean, it has colonial sources, but it also has sources in many communities to, to feel that there's some, for people to feel somehow that some version is more pure or better is coming from a lot of places. And I think that should be avoided and, 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 and there should be a sort of openness to different ways of speaking that, that, that keep people kind of in the, in the conversation. But I still think that there are kind of implicit or suggested or kind of ways that some kind of standardization or unity can still be promoted. We have time for just one more question. 
Hi. Hi, Ross. Hi, Charlie. Stelma. Hi. I just wanted to share a little bit about uh, my experience working in a local uh, government agency where I have witnessed and experienced the repression that multilingual speakers have. It, multilingualism is not a valued skill um, in this country, and I've seen it in, in my workplace. Um, I have worked at times as an interpreter in my role uh, in an overtime capacity, and the power of the monolingual English staff is great. Uh, when there is overtime pay, for instance, they want, they consider to be fair, uh, having the ability to earn overtime and not really the ability to provide a quality service to members of the public um, because they figure, well, we can always uh, use an app and call the language line, which charges four or five times more than what staff uh, uh, earn. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's been really disheartening to see. Uh, just institutionally how uh, discrimination against mu multilingualism, multilinguals is entrenched within our institutions and across society. Um, but it also gives us an opportunity to think about other ways in which we can support multilinguals. Uh, I mean, that's certainly something that I have been thinking about. Um, and we've talked about this a little bit, um, nothing that we've pursued uh, too intensely yet because it does take a lot of commitment and a lot of uh, collaboration among uh, speakers of indigenous languages. And indigenous peoples in particular, when they migrate here uh, or are forced to migrate, their life in the city is not easy, right? We know that many work what, uh, two or three jobs at a time. So uh, thinking about ways in which uh, like for me, for instance, thinking about way ways in which uh, I can support with the knowledge that I have within an, a bureaucratic institution to uh, provide contracts that would allow uh, indigenous language speakers, indigenous peoples to be the providers of the services and the primary recipients and beneficiaries of uh, the funding that the uh, local government agencies have uh, to provide services. And I think maybe you might be wondering what you could do as well, right? I, I, if you are lawyers, uh, if you uh, know something about starting a business, maybe you can contact the ELA and be a resource that we can uh, contact you later to, uh, uh, to maybe move some, along, uh, some of these ideas along that uh, indigenous peoples have expressed uh, a desire in uh, being supported on. And, and I think that not only, um, because it's, it's very important in, in uh, I, I, I mean, just in learning about my own family history, how, um, how a, a language is man maintained uh, is related to the context, to the society in which they live, right? And, and, and to being able to remain autonomous in their village, not having to migrate. Uh, because even in the in 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 our homelands, the languages are being lost, right? So think about maybe your roles, our roles here uh, in the United States, and how uh, we're actually or the uh, the um, the policies of our government, how those actually displace people from their homelands as well. Um, uh, what else was I going to say? Sorry. Um, Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm just maybe I'm digressing, but uh, yes, there's there there. I, I I feel like as a member of the audience, like you might be interested to know what it is that you want to do. But if you have if you do have like particular skills, uh, maybe you're not an, an indigenous language speaker, but maybe you know, like I mentioned, yeah, you you know something about starting cooperatives and providing legal uh, pro bono legal services. Maybe you can contact uh, Charlie or Ross about that and continue those discussions. Thank you, Thelma. Um, Th Thelma is is a, a real uh, has a real workhorse for indigenous languages, um, Latin American languages here in, in the city. Um, working with a city agency, I won't name your city agency <laughs> in case they're here. Um, but it takes people like Thelma, right? It takes people like when we did the Worker Bill of Rights, right? It wasn't just like. I reached out, like sent, you know, interact, like 
some emails back and forth and then you know it was done no it took it takes like takes pe- taking people out for coffee it takes people like understanding where people are like like what are their self interests and cuz they're humans right also at, at these city agencies um and you know it takes it takes a lot of education like educating people about why is this important like why why should you do this like what is it, what is it how does it benefit you how does it benefit the city um and and unfortunately what i see sometimes in the city like in government agencies is a turnover right like in two or three years there's like a new staff person under that same outreach role and they're just you got to have to do kind of have to do the same thing all over again right and who knows if that person's going to be receptive so p- having people like them uh, having people whoever wherever you all are are situated you know people like you are you are like advocating or just keeping these things in mind is super helpful um but like we were saying before like cultural awareness uh cultural sensitivity is super important and if anything hopefully you all walk away with that from from this and like now that you know hopefully you can acknowledge and like see like the, you know the the indigenous languages are here they're very much alive they're everywhere um you go around the city um maybe you don't see it every day maybe you haven't noticed it but it's it's there um so i'll i'll part i'll part with that um and i don't know if you wanted to say any last words ross uh, that's that's perfect yeah thank you telma thank you charlie for those words thank you all for coming um indigenous languages are here and as charlie said i think by just beginning with that recognition um that's that's already a first step and uh and then hopefully it goes from there so thank you all for coming thank you to the center for brooklyn history thank you thank you